I am joined by two men who have been following this news very, very carefully in Washington. Seth Bereswag of uh, Bereswag Leonard. Seth specializes in white collar crime and compliance issues. And right here in New York, Richard Roth of the Roth Law Firm. Gentlemen, as Congress shines a spotlight on the inner workings of MF Global's final days, a lot at stake for folks like Edith O'Brien and, of course, John Corzine himself. Uh, you know, Seth, give us some perspective of, of what could actually happen to either one of them if any of this turns out to be true. Well, certainly Ms. O'Brien has made it clear that she is negotiating uh, some kind of an immunity deal with federal prosecutors. Uh, the word is that she's uh, close to that. So if she gets, depending upon the kind of immunity that she gets, uh, then she really uh, may be able to just go through the system without being subject to prosecution. Mr. Corzine is still subject to uh, exposure on a lot of issues. Uh, and frankly, I think the Sarbanes-Oxley violation, potentially a potential violation here, is something that lurks in the background. These hearings demonstrate that MF Global was like an airplane uh, without the flight crew. Uh, nobody really knew what was going on. The only person with information took the fifth and was told that she could leave. So it was really high drama uh, on Capitol Hill today. Yeah, Richard, I mean, you know, w one of the big questions, of course, is whether or not uh, they could actually move money from a customer account into uh, one of their own accounts uh, to cover a shortage. Uh, oftentimes, Richard, that's that's completely 100 percent legal. So are we in Murky ground here? Is this what they're trying to determine whether or not in this particular case it was something that was allowed to have happen? That's exactly right. Generally speaking, you are not allowed to move money from customer accounts. There are there is an exception to that rule. But what's fascinating here is as Christine Sirwinski, who also is testifying today, was on vacation and she contacts the Chicago office. She was a CF, CFO of, of MF Global um, North America. She contacted the Chicago office concerned that money is being transferred improperly. Therein, that's October 27th. For the next four days, the proverbial, you know, what hit the fan, and Miss O'Brien presumably was right in the middle of that. So it, it gets very serious here, what, what, what went on at MF Global for those four particular days. Well, Richard, it sounds like there's confusion, but there's still no sense of, of what actually happened, and therefore kind of undermines the notion of a smoking gun. Isn't that right? So far, yes, but you have e you also have somebody testifying today from J.P. Morgan who is going to testify, at least that's, the, that's what it's been announced as, that they contacted actually John Corzine and MF Global on the 28th of October telling them what is going on here with the transfer of money from customer accounts. So there were email correspondence. There is some correspondence going around, and John Corzine is in the middle of this. So they are circling. The question is whether they can actually get to the truth in light of the fact that Ms. O'Brien is taking the Fifth Amendment. Now, Seth, you're not in agreement. Why exactly? Well, because I agree, and Edith O'Brien is the person that really has all the information. Once she wraps up the plea deal, uh, once she uh, confirms her immunity, which I suspect she will shortly, I agree that she's going to be providing the additional information. Documents in a hearing are similar to a deposition. You get behind the documents, you ask the questions to get the internal information from behind the scenes. She has smoking guns, she has information. That's going to be critical. But the bottom line is that MF Global has really become the poster child for the need to focus on internal controls compliance because all these people are in the hearing room on Capitol Hill today and nobody's able to say what happened and that's just ridiculous. Well it sounds like she's just saving her ammunition for later though. Oh that's absolutely well, true. Well I agree with that. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, well, I agree with that. She, she's saving her ammunition, but she, her lawyer knows what's going on. In a situation like this, the, the, the defense counsel reaches out to the prosecutor's office and confirms the immunity to get, hopefully, transactional immunity or the broadest type of immunity possible. They're smart. They know what they're doing. I believe that ultimately she will provide the information and it will be a trail. I agree that Mr. Corzine is really in a hornet's nest. This is a huge hornet's nest and more information will be coming out shortly. So what do you think could actually have been at play here? I mean, what is, what is Richard, the worst case scenario for John Corzine? The worst case scenario is that John Corzine, between October 28th and October 31st, had personal knowledge, actually knew that money was being taken from customer accounts to pay back J.P. Morgan on the overdraft that happened. If he knew that there was improperly money being taken from customer accounts, which is a big no-no, there is an exception with regard to international customers, but generally speaking, if John Corzine had his finger on that pulse, and we do know that the CFO of MF Global North America knew it, so certainly there were very high levels people at very high levels who actually will be testifying and John Corzine is as as counsel just said in the hornet's dust
Well, what would actually require him to go from the hornet's nest uh, to, jail? To, to jail, right? Because, I mean, who's to say it's just he said versus she said? Well, it isn't a well, he said. If, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I apologize. Just a brief answer. Uh, the, the, if you have to show knowledge, but you can also have something that's known as willful or deliberate ignorance. If there was essentially a gross negligence standard where he knew or should have known, that's also something that the prosecutors could latch on to. So they're going to dig deeper in to see what they can find in, uh, in terms of what he knew or should have known during that critical time frame of those But that of kind days. of gross negligence, isn't that pretty hard to prove, Seth? Well, it is, but that's why Ms. O'Brien is so critical here, because that's not going to be an easy case to prove, but they need her cooperation. So if you can rise to the mm -hmm. level of deliberate or willful ignorance, then there's a shot. But it's not going to be okay. easy for the federal prosecutors. All right, this brings us right back to sort of where we started. How do you get Ms. O'Brien to cooperate, Richard? I mean, we, we talked briefly about the idea of immunity. Um, how do you get her to say, I mean, if she really believes that she's innocent, that John Corzine is innocent, that everyone's innocent, then why does she even need to be partaking in this at all? I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily agree that she believes she's innocent. I, what you want to do is give her immunity so she has what's called transactional immunity so she then can speak. Money was transferred. There are individuals who press buttons to transfer wires from MF Global to JP Morgan and possibly from customer accounts. So it's not really he said, she said because there is, there is, there is a, there's a money trail. There are emails that went back and forth. The other person that's going to be very important is Diane Genova, who's deputy counsel at JP Morgan. She herself had conversations with John Corzine. So once she talks, Talks, you will hear, presumably, we will hear the entire story, which will be buttressed by emails and wire transfers and other documents, which will substantiate her story. What would you advise, if you were Edith's lawyer right now, Edith O'Brien's lawyer, what would you advise her to do? Richard, first to you. Yeah, I would advise her to um, not speak, to take the Fifth Amendment, to work out a deal with the prosecutors, because at the end of the day, the prosecutors want the big fish. And John Corzine is a huge fish. That's what they want. They want to really go after the people that made the decisions here. Right. So, so the answer to her is, for her is to, to work out a deal with the prosecutor, at which point in time she can have immunity and, not, and be free from prosecution. That, and, that's her goal. And Seth, what would you advise John Corzine if you were representing him right now? <laughs> well, unfortunately, I think that he's going to not be able to invoke the Fifth Amendment because he's already put himself out there. What I would tell him is just to hunker down and just try to get as many documents as possible and just watch developments. It's going to be very, very difficult for him right now. Uh, this really is a huge hornet's nest, and I agree that Ms. O'Brien needs to get that immunity deal wrapped up. The, Mr. Corzine's biggest problem, among other things, J.P. Morgan knew what was going on. They went right in there on that Friday and asked for broad memos for assurances. Everybody knew what was going on except the people inside MF Global. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Very interesting perspective from both of you, Richard Roth of the Roth Law Firm, and we had Seth Berenswag of Berenswag Leonard. Thank Thanks. you so much.